Next, yeah, next week, we're going to be taking off. We might be back, but we're going to be taking off. Be praying for us because we're going to be going down, down south, and uh, we've got a big event that we're going to go to also, so we're going to have a lot of fun with that. And then also, we're going to have, uh, we might have some special speakers coming up. So we'll see. Matthew chapter 16. I want you guys to see this, y'all. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. The title of my message this morning is The Big Picture. The Big Picture. We must never forget that, that, that Jesus is building something on the face of the earth that cannot be stopped. And we're going to see this here in the scripture. And as we come into this world, as we come into this life, we have to see that before we got here, God has already had a master plan. He's had a picture of what he would do, what he wanted to be established, and and what he had ordained to take place upon the face of the earth. We come into that. We're coming into that. And so it would do us well to understand God's master plan and what he is building. And that's why these holy scriptures are so important because historically, culturally, all those things are laid out in the scripture, but we don't take time enough just to analyze the scripture, get into here, get in here, and then just really find out what, what is God's plan all about? What is it all about? And so this book is not just spiritual, although it is spiritual. It is, it's also historical. It gives us great context of things that have happened on the face of the earth and what we should know so that we can, so we can plan accordingly and get in line with God's overall purpose. This book is also prophetic because it gives us a glimpse into what was. It's historical, but it also is prophetic. It gives us insight into what's to take place in the future. I want to align myself with what God has said. Well, the way in which I do that is, is by studying the scriptures, Amen. understanding the scriptures, taking time to get this in my spirit so that I can weigh everything that I am seeing, I can weigh it by what has been said. That everything that I am seeing is weighed by what has been said, that God has already mapped it out. And so now my vision becomes clearer. And I want to be able to, as a Christian, see the big picture. Sometimes we get so consumed with just God, what he's doing in my life, what he's doing in my country, what he's doing in my marriage or with my kids. And we get so consumed that we, we do not take time to say, okay, well, I also want to, I want to enjoy those things, but I also want to see the big picture. I want to see the painting. I want to see the full picture on this canvas. God has declared this is what the picture looks like on this canvas. And I want to be able to see that. But if I get so consumed with just my little portion of this life, then I won't be able to see the bigger picture. God wants us to see the big picture and understand it very clearly. One of the things concerning God's big picture that we must see, saints, is that Jesus is building his church. Look at this here. It says here in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16. When, Philip, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I am? No, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my what, y'all? He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
and I will give you the keys of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, it says, will be loosed in heaven. So I love this because one of the things that we have to see is that the church is a nation in the midst of the nations. It is a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people, God's own special people. The ecclesia, the church, the called out company of people have gathered together and God is forming and, and, um, and making us who we are called to be. The church is a life-giving organism in the earth. It's, it's growing and it's moving, it's forming and it's, it's continuing to grow. And in fact, he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will try to stop, but will not prevail against it. It's going to grow. It's going to move. But the church is not just an organism. It is also an organization, meaning that there's structure, that there's government. There's a process in place by which God has, uh, has created, um, you know, like I said, government within the house of God. And we always have to be remindful, mindful of that because the church is not just an it or a thing in the earth. It's something that God is building. The Lord Jesus said that he would build his church. And I love this because the church doesn't belong to us. Amen. This church, this church here, this local church does not belong to me. I am an under shepherd. And so what happens is we all have to realize that as being a part of the church, being called out, the called out company, and being a part of the church, that, that we always have to consider this, that we belong to God, church, the church government or structure belongs to God, the church as a life-giving organism belongs to God, that this is about him. He, he picks who he wants to, to, to lead in his church. He's the one who shifts and organizes and, and does those things. And my job and our job is to partner with him so that we'll become everything that he's envisioned for us so that the big picture is really on display. But if we get consumed with all the cares of this life to the point that, that we become, and you guys hear me talk about this all the time, we become overly political, overly this, and we get so caught up in, in all this stuff that we lose sight of the fact that God wants us, yes, be involved in the political process, be involved in all the stuff that goes on. You Be involved. I, hey, cash or vote, do your thing. But always keep in mind the big picture. Jesus is not coming back, y'all, for the United States of America. He's not coming back for Russia. He's not coming back for Afghanistan. He's not coming back for any country as we know it. He, he said that he would build his church, and he is coming back for a bride that is without spot and without wrinkle. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We enjoy all this stuff. It's a blessing. But keep in mind the big picture that Jesus said that he was building his church. And I'm a part of the church, and you're a part of the church. He's building us, and he's making us a holy temple. We're going we're gonna to see this here. He's making us and transforming us into something. And so one of the things that we don't want to do is we don't want to be like Lot's wife. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. We don't want to be like Lot's wife. Lot's wife, she got so consumed with, the, with this life and so consumed. And, and the angel turned her, don't look back. But, you know, but, but my car's back there. Yeah. And my house is back there. My, my red bottom shoes is back there. <laughs> my gators is back there. My, my Dooney and Burke, my, my suit, my suit, man, I just got a super 150 suit. I got, what is this? God said, you got to let it go. God, look. And what, what happens is, is that we learn to be in the world but not of the world. And we, and we thank God for the stuff. How many are grateful that God blesses you with stuff? We thank God. We don't, we're not saying, God, you hear us. We're not saying, don't give us stuff. 
We're saying, just don't let the stuff have us. Can I have an amen? God said, let it go. So what happens is, is we learn to live our lives where we're in the world, we're not of the world, and yet we were able to participate in certain things, but we did, don't get consumed with them because we see the big picture that Jesus Christ is coming back for his church, for his bride. He's coming back for his bride. The devil said to Jesus when he took him up on the mountain as he was fasting, he said, Satan looked at Jesus and said, fall down and worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. That is a very interesting statement because it tells us that at the end of the day, there is a thread of wickedness in all the kingdoms of this world. that the devil is pulling strings. And if we start to think that, that, that our nation or our people or our group or this group, oh, we don't have any of that, the devil is lied. So Jesus didn't say that he was coming back for the nation. He said he's coming back to receive his bride, the called out company, the ecclesia, the church, the people of God. And the people of God are composed of Jews and Gentiles, people from all nations, creeds, and colors. That when you look up that Jesus has done such a beautiful job of drawing people to himself, and he draws them to himself by the power of his spirit. And then he causes us to, to take down all the walls that would separate and really help all of us to see that our lineage can be traced back to Adam who fell in the garden. And the same Adam who fell in the garden, that same seed in nature that needs to be changed is on every single one of us. But then Jesus comes and said, yes, I know that your nature is bad, but I'm going to give you a new nature. And I'm going to give you a new Adam, the second Adam. And that Christ becomes the second Adam and he's the one that is the source of our life. So now that the old man doesn't rule us anymore. And every day we choose to make a decision to crucify the old Adam so that we might be alive in the new Adam, in Christ. And then he's looking for those people, those people who have been called out and then now have been drawn to him. And then they've ex received him and believed the gospel. And then now he walks with them. And then for all of us, we learn to walk down this path with the Lord. And then it doesn't mean that we don't enjoy our lives or enjoy the world in which God has put us in. But we see the big picture. We're not confused. So in order to do this, what the Lord does is he begins to raise up churches. We have the church, global, universal we have the church, but then we have local churches because God, just like your body, there's, there's hands, there's feet, there's fingers, there's, there's all the other members of your body that function together to help you to go in a certain direction, and everything can't be the head. So in local churches, he, he, so he raises up local churches and he gives pastors that he has called and given vision to, he gives them a vision. So that, that part of the big picture can be seen. And this is really what I want to talk to you guys about this morning. We're going to revisit the vision of this church. And we're going to talk about it. And I'm going to preach about it. And we're going to get happy. <laughs> so then we see, the, we see a part of the vision of what God is doing. We see the big part. And in seeing the big part, we see the part that God says, okay, this is... This is what God gave to my pastor. That is a part of the big picture. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. I mean, 19 to 22. When God spoke to me and gave me the vision for this church, he gave me a seven-point vision for the church and reminded me, this is what I want to see. This is what I want to see, and this is why we call it the vision. This is what people should see or sense when they come to this local church. And as they come to this local church, 
It should be something that is clearly evident. Now, it doesn't happen in one day. You build your church. He said, I would build. So he's building his church pro progressively over time. And for our part, what we're doing is helping to see the manifestation of this take place within this local church. The first point that God gave me was, number one, that our church is called to be a habitation of God through his spirit. A building or dwelling place to reveal God's glory and power. A habitation of God through his spirit. A building or, hab or dwelling place to reveal God's glory and his, and his power. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to look down here. At verse 19. Let's look at verse 19. It says here, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He says, in whom, now look at this y'all, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God where y'all in the spirit and so this is one of the, the first point that God gave me as I was sitting in my house at 72 incline green in Alamo California in my my office and I was sitting there, and this is the first thing. We want to make sure that our church is a dwelling place for God. That this is a place where our church is a habitation. When people come, be, come to this church, we want them to feel the presence of God. We want them to know that God is real. And it doesn't just happen just by, you know, putting up cameras and putting up, you know, instruments and putting up stuff and, and getting, you know, stuff. It's just not the stuff. It's, it's creating a culture within the church where we are always mindful of God and his presence and we are desiring and seeking him to, to, um, to abide with us and to be in our midst and to do nothing that would frustrate that. So as a church, as a pastor of this church, I'm always conscious of that. Lord, how do you want this to be? Just like you heard me this morning, I'm thinking, okay, this worship is for God. Okay, how do we make God happy? How do we bless God? What creates the, the, the stage for him to enter in? Because it doesn't just happen, y'all. And so what happens is we want to be a dwelling place. Now, that means that every single one of us has to understand that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, that he dwells. He said he would dwell among us and walk among us, and he would be our God. We would be his people. And so what happens is we have to see that my life is bigger. I'm, I'm always, I always want to be conscious of God's presence in my life. And then when I come to church and I congregate with the rest of the, the congregation, then now, like I always say, I use this word, something synergistic begins to take place. Something happens, and it, something happens, and it releases something. Well, our church should be a, a, a habitation for God through his spirit, a dwelling place to reveal God's glory and power, that God begins to manifest himself in our midst. We want that, and we want that for our church, but saints, we want that for our homes. You want your home to be such a habitation that God's presence is in your home. That God's presence is in your home. But it's hard. How can you get God's presence in your home if, if you're up at night looking at pornos? Or if you're up at night, if, you, if we're doing stuff that, that would cause God to say, ah, I don't know if you really want me there. We want to always be conscious of that. Like, I want my house to be a dwelling place for God. I want my life to be a dwelling place for God. And then our church, that when people come to our church, that they feel the presence of God. That God, you know what, I may not understand it, but something different in there. Amen. It's the presence of God. 
And so we want to do that. And so this is one of the things that you guys hear me. Sometimes I'm kind of stuck on stuff and I'm very firm with stuff because this is the vision. I don't, I, this isn't my church, but this is the vision that God gave for the church. So we want to be a dwelling place. How do we get God's presence to manifest and we create an atmosphere in this church where God feels comfortable? We're so consumed with if people feel comfortable. You know, we, just, we can't have this mentality. We just want the seats to be filled. No, we want God to fill this place. And if he be lifted up, then he will what? Draw all men to himself. We want to lift him. We want to bless him and give him glory. And then he begins to draw and his presence begins to draw. This is what we want to do. That's point number one. Point number two. A community of extravagant lovers of God and each other. Go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22 this was the second point that God had given me. Verse 37 on down to 39. Jesus said to him, one of the Pharisees and the lawyers, he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so this is point number two. This is what God had given me, a community of extravagant lovers of God and each other. And so we want our church to be an atmosphere where people feel and sense the love of God. Now, I've been teaching this for years, and I always, are, always try to hammer this home. You know, we, we have to stop defining the love by, by the world's define, how they define it. The world, the devil is very crafty, and he has tried. What he does is he takes something that God, he knows God has established or is establishing and then he comes behind and he begins to try to twist it and redefine it does it all the time he did it he's doing it with grace he's done it with love and so then the world takes our he takes our code words he takes our language my goodness he's even take taken our rainbow The devil. <laughs> Taking our rainbow. The devil take and he twists it. He tries to twist it. And so what happens is, is this. It's the same thing with love. The enemy wants it. So what, I, what, what we have as a leadership team have tried to do here is just help people to understand the biblical um, definition of love. And let me say this to y'all. Love does not give you everything you want. Love gives you everything you what? Need. Gives you everything you need. And what happens is, is we are in a position now where the devil has tried to redefine love to the point where it's just you get your way. You love me because you gave me your way. Gave me my way. You gave me my way, that means you love me. But true biblical agape doesn't just give you your way. Did, nobody really would have picked Jesus to do what he did. They wanted him to come and overthrow the Roman Empire and do something different. And he said, no, I love you enough that I'm giving you something greater than that. People didn't receive it and understand it at the time, but God knew. And his love, we want to be a church that always loves people. And that means that we're willing to tell people the truth in love. We want to make sure that we do that. And we have to become, see, lust is always a taker. And I've been teaching this for years, love is a giver. 
that we give of ourselves to be a blessing to other people and people may not always appreciate it, may not always understand it and sometimes even reject it, but we wanna create a community here at this church where people really come into the blessing of God's true biblical love. You know, even the scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and rebukes and scourges every son because it's his love. I can't let you be, I want you to be like me. This is what God is telling us. I can't let you get away with that. I want you to be like me. And so God, he doesn't, I'm so grateful that God doesn't just let me get away with stuff. Because I don't know about you, I've got some spankings from the Lord. And I know it was God's love for me. And I've told y'all stories and stuff that happened to me. And it, just like I told you about how I went up in that, that, that mountain, I got hit in my eye. But I think, I just knew it was the love of God. God was trying to protect me from some mess. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, hey, Pastor, let me ask you a question. You know, I know when you went up in that mountain and then God got you and, and you tell us a story about how, you know, God got you. And then he said, but now I know you got a new house. Well, did God say anything about that? Did he just, I, said, I said, how are you going to bring up that story? How do you remember that? No, this is a different situation. But, but the point I'm trying to make is, as the saints, we need to love each other. Can I have an amen? amen? Love people though, and do it the right way. Do it the right way, the biblical way. And so God, has, this is what God wants to see in our church. He wants to see. As we look at the big picture, this is part of the picture. It is this part over here. I want to see this manifest. I want this place to be a place of great love. Number three. A house of prayer for all nations. A house of prayer for all nations. Go to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 15, on down to 17. It says here, in verse 15, so they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, is it not written my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it, he says, a den of what, y'all? A den of thieves. This is a problem. When I was sitting there writing this down, this was the third thing that came to my mind. Bam. That our church would be a house of prayer for all nations. We have been very intentional in making sure that within this church that we do not tolerate any form of racism from any culture, from any culture, that we welcome every creed, every color, everybody that is calling on the name of the Lord. And then we have a, in the atmosphere, and you just look around this church, we have an atmosphere of people um, that has been forged from the very beginning. We don't tolerate that stuff. And you guys know that I'm very aggressive against that stuff. I, I don't like that. I, I, I don't like when people are, are racist towards other, other ethnicities. I don't like it at all. I, I, I really, I hate that stuff. And then one of the things, and I tell you that, and I mean for, er, for every race, because I grew up around that in my own home. I tell you guys all the time, my grandfather, he was racist. Well, a black person can't be racist. Yeah, he can. Who said? I mean, just some of the stuff that comes up is just so devilish. Whatever sphere of influence that you have, that you have the ability to impact, if you take that influence and then you begin to use it to sow seeds of discord towards another race or creed or color, then you've taken 
your influence and you've used your system within your home to create a, a, uh, a potential, you know, demonic entryway in your home. And so you may not have maybe a big corporation or a business, but you do have a family. And you can poison e any one of them. And this is what my grandfather did. He didn't have a big, you know, business that he could, you know, use and pervert and stuff like that. But he did have a home and he tried to get me. And you shouldn't like them. Don't like white people. And I'd be like, what? And I'm, I'm, I'm 10, I'm 11 years old. But like, these people, that's my friend. Racism is taught, y'all. Just go to a playground. You'll see the kids. They, the kids don't care. You go to you. They don't care. They're not even tripping off somebody's color. But then you do that. And, it, and, it, and I'm not just saying for my situation, but you have Chinese people that teach people don't like that, country, that, 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 the, don't like that color. Don't like this color. Don't like that color. You have white people that say don't like that color. You have, you know, Japanese people. It's, it's everywhere, y'all. But we got to kill it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And the church, the church, God wants to raise up. He said for all nations. So he's trying to raise us up. But it's a shame that the most segregated day of the week is Sunday morning about 1030. And we have to break that over the body of Christ because that's not what God is looking for. Now, I thank God in our church. We don't, we don't have that issue in our church. Our church is, praise God, we're seeing that God has broken down these walls. We got to make sure that it never creeps into the church, though. It never creeps into the church. That it never seeps into the church. And I, and, I, and I want to just say this, and I thank God. And some of you guys know I've traced back my, my, my lineage. So I can show you pictures of people that were enslaved in my family on my, on my page, on my Ancestry.com page. So don't get it twisted. I know where I came from. And I know the heartache and the struggle and the pain and the suffering of the people of my race went through. But as I stand as a child of God, I have to say, hey, listen, I'm not in bondage. I am not captive to what happened in my past. I am not disgusted. I am free as all get out. And no devil can stop me. I don't care what color you are. You can be green, but you can't stop the power of the blood of Jesus that has come forth and broken me out and gave it caused me to be a blessing and blessed in the earth. You can't stop my blessings. Can I have an amen, y'all? So I'm not nobody's victim. I'm victorious in the name of Jesus. And God took a little bald-headed kid that was broke, busted, and disgusted and lifted me up and gave me an opportunity to go off and do something great in the earth. And so praise God. I can't speak for everybody else. But if you want to stay in the cage, you can stay in the cage. But I got up out of that cage, and I'm walking free in Jesus. Can I have an amen, y'all? That's, that's how I do my ancestors justice. I want them to be looking from heaven and saying, there you go, boy. But what happens is, but what we all have to realize is that ethnicities have always fought with ethnicities. But, when, but we've got to get to a place that in the church, we become a house of prayer for all nations. And this is what God is doing in our church. And we have to also realize it is we want all nations, but we want to be a house of prayer for all nations. That our church is a praying church. This church started through prayer. Through prayer. This, this congregation started through prayer. And we have been praying every week. Have we even missed a week, Jennifer? We have been doing this for 20 years. And maybe we missed one week. Maybe. Every week we pray. 
every week. As a, I'm talking about corporately. And so what happens is we want to be a church where we, we, we excel in prayer. That we excel in prayer. We break all the racial lines. We excel in prayer. And we continue just to, to, to move forward. And this is what our church is built upon. And so this foundation will never be moved because Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Can I have an amen? amen. Number four. A community of worshipers who prevail by worshiping in spirit and in truth. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, this was the next point that God gave me. John chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus has met the Samaritan woman. And as he's conversing with her, he says something here in verse 21. Let's look at verse 21 on down. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers, somebody say true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We want to worship God out of, in the reality and out of the reality of our spirit. Now, what I mean by that is we are tripartite beings. We are spirits. We possess a soul, and we live in this shell called our bodies, Bodies are what helps us to give expression. But the real you is inside the shell. When you die, only thing that's going to happen is, is your, this, your, your outer man is going to go to the earth. And then your spirit and soul are going to go into the presence of God. And then when Jesus Christ returns and we return with him, then you're just going to get a new body. Some of y'all like, yeah. <laughs> well, praise God for that. But you have to remember that your, though your outward man is perishing, your inward man is being renewed day by day. So what's happening is your inward man, God is transforming you from the inside out on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what God is looking for, because we have to remember when Adam fell, his spirit chamber was cut off. And then now he became just soulish. He was governed and ruled by his mind, his will, and his emotions. And he was just soulish. He wasn't spiritual. So what happens is when Jesus comes, he awakens our spirit man. He awakens our spirit man. And then he causes us, and the Bible says that my spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit that I'm a child of God because he's awakened my spiritual chamber and compartment. And then now I start to be more aware of God. You know how you get saved and all of a sudden you say, man, God is real. <laughs> Your spirit man has been awakened. And so now because God is spirit, you're able to relate to him spirit to spirit. So Jesus is telling her, you guys worship, but you don't know what you worship. He said, but God is seeking such to worship him this in spirit and in truth. So what happens is now we start to worship God out of the reality of our spirit, man, and it becomes a sweet smelling savor to his nostrils because we're not just doing something like the Jews were doing, just the phylacteries and the ceremonies. And just praying to the welling wall and just doing the acts, the acts. And like our worship is not just burning the candles. And that we actually, out of our bellies, begin to flow rivers of what, y'all? Living water. That we begin to flow with God. And then our spirit man is awakened. And now when you begin to worship God, out of your spirit man, you begin to worship God. And then God begins to touch you spirit to spirit. He awakens you. So he spent in spirit and in truth, the reality of your spirit. It's not just the external stuff that we do. It's what comes out of your spirit that you're worshiping God in spirit and in truth. 
Well, this is what we want to create here in the church, that people come and they become a part of this church and they come in to worship, which become, now watch this, y'all, which becomes our lifestyle. We're a church where worship is our lifestyle. It's what we do. And when we come to sing our songs, that we're not singing from a place of just religion and religiosity and just Lord, I give you my heart. <laughs> no, it's not just, oh, I got to do this. It's like, no, it just comes out of your spirit because God is real to you. Can I have an amen, y'all? Well, we want to help people to get to that kind of relationship in their walk with Christ. We don't want to have dead church, just religious ceremonies. We want the reality of God's spirit. So this is what we've tried to do and forge this. And from the very beginning, this is part of what we've preached, that God wants us to worship him. And we learn how to live this lifestyle and blesses him as God has unlocked our spiritual chamber and caused us to be born again. Can I have an amen, y'all? Number four, what God gave me. I already said four, right? Number five, what God gave me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, a community of defenders and lovers of the truth. That we as a church community would be a community of believers that love the truth and that also defend the truth. Now, your love for the truth and your defense of the truth, let me say this to all of us here, it may cost you. So when, God, when God began to speak to me about this, it's one of the points, this fifth point, it was clear that, you know what, son, this may cause you to get into some trouble. Or to have some trouble. Look what it says here in verse 9. The coming of the lawless one, he's talking about the Antichrist, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception. Among those who perish, because, now look at this, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. So God reminded me that one of the ways in which people are going to fall into deception in this last age is because they do not have a love for the truth. They don't have a love for the truth. Truth will cost you. It will cost you. But always remember that Satan is the father of lies. He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and that more abundantly. He wants to bless, he, he came that we might have life. But the enemy gets away because, gets in our way and causes people to stumble because they don't have a love of the truth. When you have a love of the truth, when the lie comes, you're able to dispel the lie, even if it costs you. And so as a church community, we want to teach people and see the manifestation of people being defenders and lovers of that which we know to be truth. And it's a shame because you watch the devil right now. I've been telling y'all. The devil is, I mean, he's formidable though. Because now even when it comes to truth, he's trying to pervert that. Brother, that's your truth. That's not my truth. So now he's trying, to, he's trying to morph truth into whatever you think is truth. And what happens is then people start thinking, well, just if I believe it, then it must be true. No. Everything must be weighed. And I say the threefold cord. I said this a couple weeks ago. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So we know that Jesus is the truth. Jesus said that he would send to us the spirit of truth, who is the Holy Spirit, and he will lead and guide us into all what, y'all? Truth. So that's the second chord. Jesus also said that his, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. He said that the word of God is what? Truth. So I want to weigh everything by that threefold chord. This is a, does this glorify the Lord that is aligned with his word? And has it been sanctioned or is there confirmation from the Holy Spirit? That's how we start to come to truth. But if I just get something in my mind and I say, that's the truth. Then the devil is, once again, he's twisting the truth. We want to be defenders and lovers of truth. Now, we want to have some word to back it up. Can I have an amen? We want to have the confirmation of the Spirit of God to back it up. And then we want to, and then what is this producing in a person's life? What kind of fruit has it producing? And so we always want to be conscious of that because information is coming at us all the time. And this information overload. Information about all kinds of things. You know, it's, it's just, and this is the problem that you have. Ooh, I got to talk about this. Saints, one of the things that's happening now is people who are unregenerate, don't know the Lord, and aren't seeking God, are now trying to censor what they say is true. They call them fact checkers. Fact checkers are always lurking. And then if you're on their platforms and they don't think that you're right, they'll just shut you down. And there's going to come a time in the preaching of the gospel when they're not going to like what we have to say. And they're going to say, we're going to shut you down. Because you preached against this. You preached against that. You said this wasn't right. You said this was And so we're going to shut you off our platform. It's coming, y'all. Just shut up and get in line is what they say. And what we want to do is make sure that as believers that we, are, we love the truth so much and will defend the truth so much that if they threaten to shut you down, if they threaten to cut you off, then cut me off. I'm not going to stop preaching. Can I have an amen? I'm not going to stop preaching. You're not going to shut me up. You may cut me off, but you're not going to shut me up. And if you throw me in prison, I'll start preaching in there too. Can I have an amen? I might start writing in there too. Like two-thirds of what Paul wrote, he wrote it from the prison cell. But he didn't stop writing. And now, 2,000 years later, we're still feasting on the letters that he wrote from prison because he wasn't afraid. He defended and he loved. Can I have an amen, y'all? We got to get it in our mind. And right now, some of our brothers and sisters in China and Afghanistan and Pakistan and various parts of the world are in prison right now. And they are, uh, they are persecuting the believers. And these believers refuse to turn on the Lord because they will defend and they love the truth. That's what kind of church we can I have an amen, y'all. Point number six. Community of deliverance and healing. Go to Luke chapter 4. This is one of the things that God challenged me with when he gave me the vision for this church. It is important that we understand that God has called us to be a church of deliverance and healing. This is what he wants to see in the big picture. Deliverance and healing for this congregation. Jesus says this in verse 18. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are what? Oppressed. 
And then he says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the verses. These are the verses that God gave me. And this is important because when Jesus comes on the scene, he comes to a people that in some ways do not even know they're in bondage. They don't even know or even think that they're in bondage. And Jesus comes along, and what does he do? He begins to heal. He begins to deliver. He begins to, to cast out devils and bring liberty to people who have been taken captive. Before any of us knew the Lord, saints, let me remind every single one of us that we were slaves to sin. Nobody had to teach you how to sin. We were enslaved to our old endemic nature, which gravitated towards darkness. And men love darkness rather than light, Jesus said. And so what happens is people gravitate towards that because our nature was flawed. Jesus came along to give us a new nature and to release us. Well, what's happening is these people thought that they were okay because they were children of Abraham. And Jesus had to correct them and help them to see that you're enslaved to sin. And as a result of that, he brought the liberty that we needed. He helped to break. He brought freedom for us and gave us power over our own sinful nature and then gave us his nature so that we can do those things that are pleasing in the sight of God, that we don't no, no longer have to be slaves to sin. Well, what happens for us is we have to convince people because some people think, I'm fine, I got a lot of money. Can I have an amen? I'm fine. My health is great. I'm fine. Can't you see how cute I look? Girl, you know I'm fine. Look at me. Look at me. Girl, you know, I, you know I'm good. We think we're fine because of all this external and all the stuff and all the other things. But it's amazing when, when I gave my life to God that I had to look in the mirror and look at the mirror and say, you know what? You got all this stuff. But man, you're foul. You need to change. You need to change. You need to change. You. Your lifestyle needs to change. That God needs to do something. And I had to come to grips with the fact that, that I was sinful. I need God in my life. I need God. I got all this stuff. And here I am. I'm still, I got, but then inside me, why am I feeling this and that? And always struggling with this and that. Something's wrong. There's an enemy in me. Jesus said, yeah. You thought if you got the money, that you were, that's all you needed. You thought if you got out the hood, that that's all you needed. You finally got out the ghetto. Now you feel like you got it, huh? But look at you. You're still struggling. You're still sinful. You still cussing and lying and cheating and can I have an amen? And then God turns around and shows you that you know what, even though you didn't think you were wrong, that you were wrong, that, that you need to change. And then what happens is, saints, we, we turn around and the guy said, I got an answer for you though, but it's going to take some repentance it's going to take some faith. If you could give me those, then I can get you out. So then God begins to change us from the inside out when we surrender to our, our lives to him. And then he starts to help you to see that you see this. You didn't think that was there, but it's there. Can I, can I, I'm going to shine the light on it. Can I take it out? Yeah, oh yeah, I want you to get that. Can you get that pride, Lord? Can I have an amen, y'all? Can, can I get that part? Can you get that part? Like, why is it every time somebody tell you to do something, you always got to have to say something back? Can I get that pride? <laughs> See, I know I'm preaching now. <laughs> they can't say nothing to you. You always got to say something back. That's called pride. God, he, 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 deliverance and healing. We need to be delivered from the old us. Can I have an Amen. And then, then we get to a place where, it be, to me, I can't speak for everybody, but to me, it becomes fun to watch God, like, God, I know I got this right here. Can you get this too? 
to partner with God as he's washing you clean and making you white as snow. Can I have an amen? And beginning to change your life. Like, man, I don't like my attitude right there. Okay, yes. Lord, thank you for showing me that. I don't like that. I need to get rid of it now. I know I can't do it myself, but Lord, I just confess that is sin before you right now. I ask that you would forgive me for that. My attitude, I got some stinking thinking right now. And Lord, can you just take that, eradicate that, destroy that. I just give that to you. I pray that you would just wash me and cleanse me of that and heal me of that, Lord, and show me how to overcome that in my life because I don't want to talk like that. I don't want to have a bad attitude. God, just cleanse me right now in the name of Jesus I thank you that you wash me and cleanse me and that you heal and bring deliverance can I have an amen and you start partnering with God and God is like yeah I've been wanting to get that well deliverance and healing begins to take place in the house of God and in the cases in this church in the cases where we see that it's not just a flesh issue, but it is a demonic issue that we can cast the devil out to. And we don't have any problem rebuking the devil, binding demons, casting them out, and saying, loose here, come out in the name of Jesus, and get people free so they can be free indeed. Can I have an amen, y'all? So in this church, I'm just telling y'all that we, by the grace of God, my prayer is we built a church that is not afraid of the devil. We respect the enemy. We know our foe is very powerful. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Can I have an amen? Jesus brought deliverance to the captives. Well, we want to have an atmosphere in this church where if it is a demonic issue, that we know what to do and how to set people free, which we do all the time. And by the grace of God, we do it. And by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have to see that the devil is gets in people and begins to tear up their lives and demons Jesus had to cast out demons but the church is so scared you don't be afraid of the devil you have the most powerful being that has ever existed ever in the history of existence living on the inside of you you better take authority over the devil and rebuke him and ca can I have an amen and cast him out of your marriage cast him out of your mind cast him out of your home cast him out of, and you allow the Spirit of God to bring deliverance and healing to your life I thank God I was exposed to that kind of teaching very early on in my Christianity because I wondered why I saw stuff and it was strange. And then, then the people of God, they helped to teach me. This is, that's the devil. Oh, really? This whole time that was the devil? <laughs> I said, yes, this is the devil. Like, oh my goodness, you can, you, you, are you telling me that voice sometimes that I'm hearing, telling me to do this, that, and that, that's the devil? Yeah, the devil's trying to get you to do, to come into agreement with him, to do the stuff that he wants you to do. Rebuke the devil, cast down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience. Can I have an amen? And I start getting that spirit, that, that scripture down in my spirit. I said, this is how I'm going to do it. And you know what? It worked. The devil. <laughs> Amen. You start, you start quoting them scriptures and watch how the devil starts taking off from your house. <laughs> Let me move on. <laughs> Number seven. We're going to close it out with this. A community of priests and kings unto God. A community of priests and kings unto our God. Go to Revelation chapter 1. And let's close this out. It is important that we as the body of believers understand our priestly and kingly duties as a congregation. When we come here, my expectation is that God is going to prosper you in the earth, in the marketplace. Going to bless you as you go out these doors and make a way for you. Because this is a part of our kingly duty in the community. That when we go outside these doors, we are taking the kingdom of God with us. And as we're operating within the marketplace, that we do it uh, um, being submitted to the spirit of God and the righteousness that he has declared through his word. 
So we operate a different way, and then God begins to promote us and move us and begin to advance us in the community. This is the kingly aspect of what we do. But then also, he said priest, and we're going to see this here. But then there's also a priestly aspect to what we do. All of us are called to serve the kingdom of God in some regard. And so we want to make sure from a, inside the church, our priestly duties, and then outside of the church, our kingly duties, that we're making sure that we're constantly aware of this and we leave room for God to use us in both realms. David was a king. King David, he was the king, but then there are times when he put on the, the linen ephod he, and he went into the temple. There was a priestly aspect that David would sometimes have to embrace. It was a prophetic picture of what happens with us at times. We have to be able to navigate through both realms and do it in a, in a, in a great way. Now, Jesus with his church, he's raising up priests and kings. It says here in verse, in verse, in verse six, did I, oh, I hope I didn't mess this up. Okay, okay, now look at this. Let's go down to verse four, up to verse four. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kingdoms of the kings of the earth. To him be loved, to, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He says what? Amen. He made us kings and priests. He made us, so this is important. So as a local church, I want to make sure that you all understand that God wants to prosper you. Your kingly duty is to go out in the marketplace, be effective, and allow God to, to prosper you in the land. And to do it, now watch this, with a certain level of confidence. God blessed you on a job and gave you a job. You walk in the authority and the spirit of grace that is upon you to be effective wherever he's made you effective in that area of your vocation. Don't apologize for prospering. Don't apologize for God moving you up the corporate ladder and giving you authority and blessing you. Don't apologize for that if God did it. Now, always keep in mind, like Joseph did when he found himself sitting next to the king because God had taken him through a process to cause him to be sitting next to Pharaoh. It, 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 don't apologize. I always remember, it was God who got me here, though. Can I have an amen? Yeah, I did some work. I made sure I did my part. But at the end of the day, if it wasn't for God, I would not be here. If it wasn't for God, I would not advance. And if I'm not, at the, if I'm not there yet and I'm going to understand the process that God's taking you through to get you to the, uh, another place, that I, it takes some humility. It takes some wisdom from God. It takes making the right decision. It takes me not just chasing after money. That I don't make decisions just based on the money. Can I have an amen? amen. So I'm not making this decision just because you guys are going to pay me more. I'm making the decision based on what I hear from God when I get on my knees and pray and seek him to see if this is what I'm supposed to do. That's how I make the decision. The money doesn't matter because you can take the job and get the money and become miserable. Can I talk about it this morning? But God is trying to help us to see that when we're in the marketplace, he wants us to, he wants to prosper us, but then we have to walk in the authority that God has given us and really realize that if God placed me here, I don't care. These demons can try to stop me, but they can't stop me. 
that, the, that they can't stop me. God's the one who placed me here, so let me make sure that I don't do anything to try to mess it up. But at the end of the day, I want to. But then from a priestly standpoint, that I also have spiritual talents and abilities and gifts that God has given me, and I want to use them effectively in my local church. What is it that God has given me to do priestly-wise that I can do to be effective in my local church to help to build my local church, to build the church that Jesus is building? I want to be able to, I want to step in with that grace and then be effective there. And so what happens for a lot of people, they say, well, that's just the church. Well, no, Jesus saved you and you're a part of the church and yes, you're going to be effective out here in the marketplace, but you're also, you also have priestly duties. What is it that God's asking me to do? What is it? Well, maybe he's asked me to be an usher. Maybe he's asked me to be in the children's ministry. Maybe he's asked me to, to be on a worship team. Whatever, whatever, what is it? I got to find out and then do that effectively. But for some people, they, don't, they think, well, they can just do that. You know, I'm just, my, my call is just to, you know, help to prosper the church just by bringing money to the church and being a blessing that way. But other than that, but that's not all. That's a blessing, but maybe God has called you. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not. When I, was at, when I was at Gateway City Church, my home church in San Jose, when I was at my home church, my wife would tell you that I had a parachurch ministry. I would go out and teach and do all kinds of stuff, and, and I'm working for the Raiders doing that. And, but then when I would come, but, but I served in my local church. I was also a part of that. I would come. And I was just like you guys. But then Pastor Dave would say, hey, I need you to pray over this person. You do this. Can you come over here? Come prophesy over this person. Da, da, da. And then I would be active and be involved, not to the, to the extent that I wanted to be at the time, but I always knew when I went to church that, that I had a place to serve in my local church. Yeah. This is what we want to do. Saints, I want to stop here. This is, this is the end, but I want to just remind you, this is part of the big picture. When you join this church, you become a part of this church, you're connecting to vision. You're connecting yourself to a vision that came to me from God. And it's proving it itself, it has proven itself to be a legitimate vision. Just look at the last 20 years. The vision will speak, and it will not lie. The vision of this church has spoken. You, you see the manifestation of it. Are there areas here with these seven points that God had given me that we need to grow in? Yes. The church is an organism. It's still growing. Are there areas that from an organizational standpoint that sometimes we have to make changes or things happen? Yes. But understand that the vision is still manifesting, and it's speaking, and it hasn't lied. It hasn't lied to us. That vision that God gave, it hasn't lied. It's speaking. And what we want to do is take the vision and then also run with it. You have to take the vision. If you feel like this is your church home, I want to take this vision. I want to run with this too. This is a part of, this is a part of what God has united me to. And I want to take this vision. I don't want it just to be pastor's vision. I want it to be my vision too because it's the vision of Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen? That's my church. And we take it and we run with the vision and then we continue just to mature and grow. And my prayer is, is that we do this so that as we're doing it, we're also seeing the bigger picture, not just our bills, my stuff, my this, but man, God has connected me to a big vision, which is a part of a corporate vision all over the world. And I want to run with that because I'm a part of the church. Amen. Can I have an amen? amen. Let's pray, y'all. Lord, we thank you. And my prayer is that once a year, Lord, we would revisit the vision of this church. Lord, there's so many things that are going on in the world and things can be so cloudy so much uncertainty that is circling around in the earth whether it's stuff that's going on with COVID whether it's stuff that's going on in various nations 
When people turn on the news, it's like something this and something that. And, and it's like our footing is unstable and, and it can be shaky. People's confidence is shaken. And I just pray that this morning that you will remind us that you are building your church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That we are not shaken. That we will prevail. That the church and the churches that you are building all throughout the world, Lord, you're raising them up and that it is a safe and healthy place. We find stability. We find footing. And a reminder that the picture is a bigger picture. And we've got to see it. Father, I just pray that you would continue to establish people in the church, that we would be the pillar and ground of the truth. And that even though there may be times when churches come under persecution, that Lord, you are standing right there fighting for your bride. And we just praise you that in you we have victory, in you we have strong confidence. In you, Lord, we find our rest. And I thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to be a part of building your church. And Lord, your bride isn't perfect. And we're not done with you working on us. You're still washing and cleansing us. You're still getting out the spots and the wrinkles. But there's no greater force on the earth than your church. You said that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Lord, you are standing in the midst of your people. You are walking in the midst of your people. You are, you are prospering your people. You are blessing your people. You have declared us to be kings and priests in the earth for your glory. And Lord, we thank you that we are not destitute that you have not left us as orphans, but you have come to us by your spirit and you walk in the midst of your church and we praise you for your love for your church, your passion for your church. Thank you for laying down your life for your church. And we thank you that you're coming back to receive your bride. Lord, help us to make ourselves ready. We want to have oil in our lamps. We don't want to be foolish, but we want to be wise. Cause us to be ready. Help us to be ready for your return. And Lord, we just pray that as, as you're giving people space to repent, that we would value that space. and We take advantage of the opportunity to make ourselves ready. We thank you, Lord, that we see the big picture. Though nations may crumble around us, your bride will not be moved. Though kingdoms are shaken, your bride will not be moved. And though philosophies change and ideas change, we thank you that your word remains the same. We thank you that you, Jesus, are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, y'all. Amen. Come on, everybody stand to your feet. You know, I was talking to my wife, and we were just talking about this yesterday. We were talking about how my wife went to she went to a, a birthday celebration yesterday and then she did she came home and we started talking about Alicia and Adam and Minister Darrell and we just started talking about some of the people that would never really have known each other and if it had not been for the church 
And it's amazing how some of you all in this room, some of you met your wives here, some of you met your husbands, some of you have met friends that will be your friends forever. And we, just a little softer, that have been, that have been for, have, will be your friends forever. It's amazing how God brings you into the company and then you find, you find people and you connect with people and then God establishes something. But it all started by me sitting in a room and God speaking to me and saying, this is what I want to see. This is the vision. And then you look now almost 20 years later and you see it manifest. It just, sometimes in my mind, it just, it's amazing to me. But the purpose, the purpose, y'all, never forget that God has drawn us together. And some people will stay, some people, God will move you on, things will happen. But always remember that the church, sometimes we're so critical of the church, but I tell you what, the church is the best thing going on this planet. Can I have an amen? I got problems with her. I can have my problem with the church. Now, I can have my problems with the church, and, and, I'm, and just like some of you mothers in here, some of you mothers in here, remember that this church was birthed through me. And people can talk bad. The, we, can, we can have our squabbles with each other. But if you outside the family and you try to talk about can I, you, you try to talk about my baby? Can I, can I have an amen? Now, we can have our discussion with each other and we get into it and stuff. Happens, but when you start coming from the outside trying to tell us, now we got to talk. But this is what happened. We sit back, the world looks at us and says all this stuff. And then we turn around and we say, oh, yeah, they, yeah the church is this, the church is that. And, and it's heathen saying it. Like, you don't got nothing to say. You don't know nothing about this. If we have our own internal issues, let's talk. But well, the problem is, saints, we don't defend each other enough. We don't defend the church enough. The church got problems, but you know what? I love the church, man. I love my church family. I love other churches, too, all over the world. I love the body of Christ. Can I have an amen? I love the body of Christ. I love the body of Christ. You can... People can say what they want, but I ain't leaving the body of Christ. I don't know where you... Can I have an amen? I ain't leaving the body of Christ. Well, the church is hypocritical. The church is that. Well, you can say what you want, but I ain't going nowhere because I'm going to be a part of the church. Amen? And we got to learn to start... Uh, uh, stop allowing the accuser of the brethren, the devil. And I'm not just talking about our church. I'm talking about church in general. The accuser of the brethren slanders church and then we sit back and we agree and instead of saying, devil, shut up. At the end of the day, Jesus is going to have his bride and his bride is going to make herself ready and that all of us want to make sure that we're doing our own internal investigation to make sure that we got some oil in our lamp. Can I have an amen? Stop being so critical and start allowing God to work on you and then if stuff comes up we gotta address, we'll address it but I, I, it irritates me sometimes when I watch the news and then they, they always blast something that, that somebody in the church does bad but they never talk about what the church does good why don't you guys blast that? that people are getting healed and delivered and set free God is saving people changing their lives restoring marriages healing people's bodies that he's changing their hearts getting depression out of their life getting discouragement off of them rebuking the enemy and bringing forth liberty breathing the word of God they're falling in love with Jesus and the spirit of God is walking with them and talking with them and that their lives have been restored and God did some great things and got forgiveness unforgiveness out of their hearts and all kinds of pride and fear why don't you talk about that on the news I don't see that on CNN I don't see that on Fox I don't see that on these news we got to get that can I have an amen, y'all? They always bring on the haters. Lord, we thank you that we are a part of your church. 
and we give you glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody said amen, amen, amen. Give somebody a holy elbow and tell them God is good. I'll see y'all next week.